Our reading is out of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And we are going to read from verse 27. Continuing with the study out of the Gospel of John. Going to read from verse 27. Chapter 42. Let us pray. Lord, you are the potter, and we are the clay. That's why we ask, Lord, mold us and form us into your image. We ask that you will use this service as well to do your work in our lives. As that song goes, Lord, that the image of Christ be formed within us so that all might be able to see him. Lord, we desire that you'll be in our midst and be present and speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 27, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, the one sows and another reaps is true. I send you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work. And you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. So far the reading out of God's word. Now we have followed the story of Jesus meeting with this Samaritan woman. And we see in this chapter... The first time he's reaching out to a heathen person. Now the nation of Israel was uniquely blessed by God. Of no other people did he ever say, You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Or he reminded Moses, he said, You are a holy people. Speaking to the Israelites, to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And God granted this nation many promises and blessings. He said to Abram, through him all the families of the earth will be blessed. He brought Abram to a good and a spacious land flowing with milk and honey. And God even promised to defend them from all their enemies if they faithfully obeyed him. 
There's always the promises of God, but there's also a condition connected to that. It said in Deuteronomy 33, Blessed are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, who is the shield of your help, and to sword of your, the sword of your majesty. So your enemies will cringe before you, and you will tread upon their high places. But they did not always obey the Lord. And when they were disobedient, the Lord let the enemies of Israel oppress them. And there were a few times when they were sent in exile. So as God's chosen nation, they had many advantages. Paul write about it in Romans as well. He said, then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? He said, great in every respect, for first of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. In His goodness, God bestowed upon Israel many privileges, more than any other nation. In that time. And the Lord also. Speak about that in this chapter. When he said to the Samaritan women. Salvation is from the Jews. And it has a twofold meaning. That the gospel was first to be preached to the Jews. And the Messiah. Came from the nation. Of Israel. But Paul also said in Verse 29 of chapter 3 of Romans, God is also the God, not only of the Jews, but He's also the God of the Gentiles. And even in the Old Testament, we read about God's gracious invitation. Isaiah 45 verse 22 says, Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God. And there is no other. And even speaking to the servant in Isaiah 49, said, you will be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And Paul Preaching in Acts chapter 13 uses these words as a mandate he had to preach to the Gentiles. And Jesus also commanded his disciples in the end of Luke, go to all the nations and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. So God's plan from the very beginning, starting with Israel, was for a global evangelism and reaching the world with the glorious light of the gospel. And here at the well, Jesus, the Messiah, is meeting the Samaritan women and he's telling her about the living water. That he is the light of the world. That he is the source of life. And she acknowledged her sin. And she confessed him as the Messiah, as the Savior. And what happened then? To confirm the genuineness of her faith, we see that she immediately went to the village there near. The passage is the first recording instance, we can say, of a cross-cultural evangelism in the New Testament. She went to her own people, She was so gripped by the gospel. It changed her life. She could not keep quiet. She had to tell other people about the gospel. And we see in this chapter as well, verse 27, that Jesus was totally in control of the circumstances. The disciples came from the town. They went, as you remember, to buy some food while Jesus was waiting at the well. And at the perfect time they came just after Jesus spoke to this woman because they would have interfered with this conversation. They were not asking, why do you speak to her? 
It says. They did not interrupt the conversation. It was a divine work that was going on and the disciples were amazed to see Jesus speaking to a woman. That was not the usual thing to do. It was a social breach of tradition. The rubbish tradition, the Judaism, they never spoke to a woman in public. But at best, they said it was a waste of time. And at worst, they said it's a distraction from the studying of the Torah. And you were in danger of losing your soul to be damned if you speak to a woman. So we were very, very bad that time. We live in different times. So they were astonished that he was speaking to this woman. Not even knowing her background, they would have been shocked to know the background of this woman. They had already learned that Jesus was not bound by Jewish tradition and expectations. He had good reason for doing what he did. And this was, and they had to learn, and the disciples had to learn, that the gospel was first to be preached to Israel. But it would not remain there. They did not accept it as they should. So the gospel went to the heathens, went to other people as well. We see there was a resistance amongst the people and it had to be broken down even in these disciples as well. We read in the story of Jonah how he refused the call of God to preach the gospel to the heathens in Nineveh. He was opposed to it, not because he feared for his life and his own safety, but he had an unwillingness to go to the enemy of Israel, the hated Assyrians. He did not want them to experience the mercy and the grace of God. That's why he prayed and he said, Lord, I I know that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He did not want his enemies and the heathen to repent and receive God's mercy. And so were the disciples as well. You can be so provincialism and have cultural prejudice, but you don't include other people. In the wonderful gospel of Christ. So Jesus had a tremendous impact on this woman's life. She went to the people she knew in that town. And she said to them, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. Jesus had such an impact on her life that she did not hesitate to share the good news. Do you know, if you have come and met Christ, if you have received the gospel of grace, if you know what it means to live under sin and the bondage of sin, if you have experienced that the Lord has lifted you out of the deep pit of sin and misery, that He has broken the chains and the bondage of the devil, you want to share that. You don't want to be keep, you don't want to keep quiet about that. She wanted to tell other people. And she eagerly desired to communicate what she has discovered in Christ. And they were so impressed by her excitement and sincerity. Do you know that is what makes the gospel believable? If you can tell other people, because you have experienced it yourself, and you are excited about it, and you are sincere about it, and they were impressed by that, and they said, we want to go and investigate. We want to hear more. We want to see more about this message. We know how you lived in the past. Something has happened. The gospel of God is not a dead thing that doesn't touch your life and your emotions. But meantime, the disciples came there and they said, Lord, eat. 
Here is some food. We came, we went to the village and we bought some food for you. He said, Jesus said, no, I don't want food. The disciples were interested in this food. That was their primary interest. But Jesus said, no, there's a higher priority. There's something more important to do. In his humanity, he was hungry. But at this stage, there was a higher priority. And he's saying, I have food to eat that you do not know. And the disciples did not understand what he meant. And Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. It says, man does not live by bread alone. But lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. He used that verse in the temptation in the desert as well. When the devil tempted him. He said, my food is more than this. I cannot only be busy with the physical. There's some spiritual food I'm busy with. And I am in the world to proclaim and to fulfill the divine will of my Father. I have to proclaim the truth to lost sinners. That was for Christ more satisfying than the physical food they could provide. That was food for him. To do the Father's will. And he's telling them. He said it's. You say. It's still four months. Until the harvest. We were planting wheat. Or grain. And the harvests. The the, the fields were green. He said four months. Then it's harvest time. And he's using it as a wonderful example. To give them the lesson about how to reach the unreached. He said, four months. But Jesus is telling them, he said, no, it's not four months. Look at the harvest. And while he's telling it to them, the people from the village, in their white clothes, maybe he's coming up the hill, or coming through this green lands of wheat and of grain. And he's telling them, he said, no. You don't need to have wait four months or six months. Now is the time for harvest. The white clothes of the Samaritans look like the harvest is ready. You don't need to wait. The harvest is ready. God has prepared the hearts of those people. And Jesus knew that these people are going to believe. He knew their hearts. And he's telling them, It's time for reaping. And they need to do that as well. And the church must be busy with that as well. We don't need to say today, we have to wait one year or two years before we go into the harvest. No, the harvest is ready. All over the world, there are people that are hungry, that are thirsty, that are seeking for the gospel. I said... He who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Those who sow and those who reap can rejoice. There's some reward. There's a great reward in preaching the gospel and bringing in the harvest. It brings joy. I've worked long time, long years amongst farmers. when, When the harvest is good, you can feel the excitement in that farmers. You can see the joy. They are reaping. But he says also, one sows and another reaps. As Paul says in Corinthians, I planted and Apollos watered and God is causing the growth. The seed has been sown. Jesus did the work. He, worked, he spoke to that Samaritan woman and she went and go and tell other people and the disciples was ready to, for the harvest. They were going to reap. They didn't do much work. They were going, just going to reap. And it tells us something in the kingdom of God as well. Not everyone is always reaping and not everyone is planting. Some plant and some reap. Many times we think we must instantly have results. There's many missionaries. 
for many years they've worked, they've labored faithfully, and no converts. But many years after that, many examples in history about that, many years after that, some other people came and they reaped the harvest. Because there were people that faithfully planted the word of God. And Jesus says, some sows and other reaps. And these disciples would have the privilege of sharing in the results of this harvest. And this passage ends with a powerful conclusion. These people said to the women, or the women said to in the first instance said to them, He told me all the things that I have done. He told me all the things. He knew supernaturally the details of her life. And they came to Jesus. And when they were speaking to Him, they asked Him to stay. And He stayed for two days. And during that time, it says they believed because of His Word. They said to the woman as well, We no longer believe only because of your testimony. We have now seen ourselves. And that's such an important thing. It tells us you have to experience Christ yourself. There's many people that only hear about Him. They hear only the testimony of other people. They read it or they read the Bible. But you need to experience Christ personally. In Job 42, verse 5, we read about Job at the end of his life, of at the end of his experience. He said, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. What a wonderful thing. These people have heard. Job said, I have heard by the hearing of the ear. Many people spoke about you. But now I have seen you. I know you. It's a personal knowledge. You know Christ for yourself. If you are a child or an old person, whoever you are, a woman or a man, you need to experience Christ personally. And these people said, now, not because of your testimony, we know ourselves and we believe. For his conversation with his non-Jew, Jesus gave an entire non-Jewish village the opportunity to receive salvation. And in doing so, he opened the door for a worldwide impact of his saving work. And he tells us the door is open for all. The new Israel is the believers. Those who belong to God's nation and are His people are those who come to faith in Christ. Those who drink of the living water. Those who receive Him as life. The salvation for all available. John said, chapter 1, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I wonder in your own personal life, can you also say, I have heard of Him, but I also have experienced Him in a personal way. I know Christ. I know my Redeemer lives. Amen. Lord, we thank You for Your message of grace. We thank You that this gospel of salvation can be accepted by everyone who believes. Behold the Lamb of God who was slain for everyone. Came into this world as, as a salvation, as an offering for everyone who will believe. To all the nations, you are the light of the nations. There's so many darkness, Lord, and we ask you that we might come to you and believe in you. And even this morning, you are ready to receive everyone who comes to you. Lord, open our eyes and let us follow in your footsteps and let us be as this woman 
with excitement and sincerity. While the harvest is white and ready, let us also go and sow the seed and reap the harvest and be full of joy in your name. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.